thank you very much again for the introduction and I'm very excited to be here. So I will talk about uh, topological methods for characterizing uh, entanglement in polymers. Um, so it will be a very broad talk. Um, first of all, I will discuss about the motivation. Uh, the motivation for my work comes from entanglement in physical systems in general. And uh, that can be in systems of macromolecules that can be polymers. It can be a collection of many polymers. Like we see here, this is uh, supposed to be, I think, a simulation of a cytoskeleton, or it can be a network of representing maybe data, or it can be single filaments. Like I think this is a DNA um, electron microscopy, maybe image, um, but it can be also other filaments like uh, wires, or it can be textiles, metal wires. And so you see the different length scales involved. And I think the last one here is uh, black matter filaments. So all these, what all these systems share in common is that they are made out of these filamentous structures, which are different type of uh, structures, of filaments each time. But, but the entanglement of these, um, of these filaments uh, is suspected or believed or maybe even shown to be related to their mechanical properties. And the challenge there remains of how, uh, how is it, uh, what is entanglement in those systems? How to measure entanglement as a, a step, a means to characterize their mechanical properties or eventually control mechanical properties by controlling entanglement. I will focus in the case of polymer melts and solutions. And these are systems of many chains of filaments. So the situation of biopolymers where we have only one filament is a little bit different, but there too we have systems of many filaments. I, I will focus on, on the viscoelastic properties of polymers. So the idea there is that um, the polymers like uh, Siliputi, for example, uh, they can behave like solids for short time scales or liquids in longer time scales. So, you know, solid putty that, uh, uh, silly putty that kids play with, they can make it into a box, a, a, a cube, uh, leave it on a table. And if you go maybe sometime later, depending on what the material was made out of, then it, you will see it flowing like a liquid. And this, uh, this, this viscoelastic properties of polymers is what makes them so, so uh, widely used because they have all these properties. So the, the, the idea, the main, a main idea of, uh, of trying to understand uh, viscoelastic properties of polymers of po or polymer mechanical properties um, is to, uh, a successful model of polymers has been the tube model. So the, the idea is that you have these many curves which look like spaghetti and uh, you want to describe uh, the motion of these, polymer, uh, of these polymers, then you can just as well consider just one polymer chain and under some conditions, maybe assume that the other chains around it are relatively fixed. Just that's a big assumption. Um, then you can imagine that the motion of this one curve, I can I just highlight it here, um, then it is constrained to move by these obstacles around it. And uh, therefore you can imagine a tube formed by these obstacles around. And therefore the motion of the chain is described by a constrained motion along this tube. And then from that motion, from that tube, there isn't really a tube there, right? But from that imaginary tube, you can derive information such as what is the tube diameter, which gives you a characteristic length scale and correspondingly a characteristic time scale. And also the tube, the, the, tube, uh, the center of the tube length, also that gives you another important length scale and time scale. So these, these um, numbers, these time scales and length scales, they correlate relatively well with experiments. 
And so the way that in, in polymer physics often entanglement is studied is by trying to derive what are these characteristic length scales and how to do this we do molecular dynamic simulations to see to get a polymer metal let's say this one and then this looks like a mess so we want to study entanglement in that so we want to find out uh, things about that tube i was describing earlier which is a, a simplification of how to look at entanglement and uh, to do that, we can imagine of, let's suppose everything is fixed for a moment, the ends or some points on the curves, these macromolecules are fixed. And let's start tightening because um, we, that will allow us to see what is going on. Overall, this looks like a big mess, but then if we start tightening, tightening, but respecting the uncrossability of the chains, we arrive at this situation here where we have created a network of these tight contacts. And then once we are here, we can derive such information as how many contacts does a chain make with another chain? Or, or on average, how many contacts a chain has along uh, its backbone? So, so this just number of contacts or distance between contacts has been successful in describing um, uh, polymer entanglement. But you see, this is a way of looking at entanglement of, this, uh, of, of these original curves, systems of curves, um, as a very discrete object, right? As some sort of local obstacles. So, which there aren't really there. Originally, we created them by uh, exactly by by doing this, um, this tightening. So, so since the 60s, I think, it was when Edwards had already thought that this is not uh, the most um, rigorous way of defining entanglement. And maybe there are, there, is, um, uh, there are more rigorous definitions in mathematics of studying complexity of curves in space. And uh, there is indeed a branch of mathematics that deals with that, which is called knot theory. Uh, but since then, it still remains, I think, for many people, at least in the community, uh, an open question whether tools from knot theory provide any information that is actually relevant to mechanics. And one reason this hasn't been used so much uh, is, uh, first of all, that um, the mathematical measures of entanglement complexity, they deal with several uh, nice things that we like in mathematics, simple closed curves in space. They are, rely on some notions in topology like topological equivalence and other things that are a little bit far from um, the, the, the situation that appears in, in nature often, which are those systems of open curves and are those systems that evolve in time and in a way that entanglement can change is not an invariant. So um, I think for me, I think these are the, the biggest problems that have, have been the obstacle. And uh, so this is what I will try to, to show today is that there are measures that can deal with open curves that are uh, inspired by knot theory and that we do capture information that is relevant to mechanics because it's one thing to measure something and it's another thing to, to make a connection, to, to ask whether it gives anything useful in practice. Okay, so the simplest measure of entanglement, very simple to define in, uh, in our theory is the linking number. So what is that? You have, you have, it is defined originally over two curves in space. So imagine you have two closed curves in space, like these examples that I show here. And to define it, you give an orientation along the curves. So you follow the curves with a certain orientation. And then what you do is you just project them on a plane. So actually those images that you see here are, in fact, they are projections, right? We just put some, there is a color with a shade to indicate they're in three dimensions. But if you think about it, we are looking at two dimensional projection really. And then in a projection, you might see no crossings at all, like this case here. 
in which case the linking number is zero. And indeed, those curves don't link with each other at all. So there is no entanglement, right, um, between them. Um, I'm just thinking, well, in some cases, even since we have a linking number zero might have entanglement, but we'll talk about it later. Um, and for topologically, there is no entanglement. And, um, but uh, in general, you might have crossings. And then what we have, you look at crossings between, let's say, blue and red curves, right? Between the two components, not of a component with itself, but between two components. And then with the orientations, we have crossings that look either like that or like that. These are two different type of crossings you can have. And we give the first one, we associate it with a plus one crossing and uh, the second one with a minus one. So then in a projection on a diagram, then you have, uh, you can count these plus and minus crossings and do their algebraic sum. And actually you want half of that, that is what the linking number is, half the algebraic sum of crossings in a diagram. So this turns out this number measures how many curve, times one curve turns around the other. So another equivalent interpretation for closed curves is that you imagine that one curve bounds a surface and then the linking number measures how many times the other curve pierces through that surface with a certain orientation. Um, so this numbers, which is simple to define, it is a topological environment, meaning that uh, no matter how much you deform these curves in three space, as long as you don't allow cutting and pasting, as long as the blue doesn't go through the red, um, this number will be invariant and no matter how the change look differently, their geometry might change, but if uncrossability is respected, they are invariant and it is an integer always. It turns out it is an integer for closed curves. And you see here that intuitively it captures um, as the integer in absolute value because it could have also negative values. As an absolute value increases, you can see the complexity be increases as well, but it is not a very strong invariant, meaning that there are many, relatively many cases it misses to capture. For example, this is the last one here. You see it has a linking number zero, while you cannot you know, disconnect the two. Uh, it is not the same as this one, right? Okay, so this is for closed curves in three space. Uh, but what about the situation where we have open curves? Well, it turns out that um, the linking number, what we call linking number, is actually defined by the Gauss linking integral by Gauss in 1870 in his studies of uh, electromagnetism. And it was defined using this integral. Well, it turns out that this integral, uh, if you break it down, what it actually captures is remember how with closed curves we took a projection and we actually saw these crossings and uh, with a sign and we took the algebraic half algebraic sum of crossings well for a closed curve that is a number we said is an invariant it doesn't depend on which projection you choose uh, compute it but for an open curve this number does depend on the projection but if you take the average over all possible projection directions of this half algebraic sum of crossings, then it gives you a number that is uh, independent of the projection. And it, is, it depends on the, just on the configuration of the curve in three space. Now, if the chain, this open, I will call it chain also as in polymer chain, okay? We're talking about curves in space, polygonal curves in space. So when this open chain um, moves, this number will, move, will change as well, but it is a continuous function of the chain coordinates. So here is, uh, for example, an open curve, uh, two, uh, two open curves, right? And you see, uh, intuitively, we would say that they are linked once. And you see the number, the linking number, is a number that is close to one. And for close, if they were actually close, it will be an integer equal to one. So we see that this number, it, it, it is um, 
It is a real number now, it can take non-integer values, but it agrees with our intuition of what is linked or not in general. Uh, however, another property of this linking, uh, Gauss linking integral for open curves is that it might be non-zero even for things that intuitively might not seem that they necessarily entangle. For example, here, this is two straight segments. And when they are in a certain relative position, as we see them here, you see they have a contribution to the linking number, absolute value 0 0.16. And as you increase the distance, this number as an absolute value decreases. So we do have, um, overall, this is, I think, a good property of the linking number because you want to, when you have a system that evolves in time and you have these contributions, you want to be able to capture as something gets closer and closer or, or as things start to entangle with each other, you want to be able to see this number growing continuously. And even if something is far apart, there is a, a potential contribution sometime uh, at some point. Okay. So this number, we can also apply this integral, we can apply it to a single curve as well in space. And uh, this is how the right um, it looks for a relatively straight segment um, close to zero. But when it ties a knot, you see this is really a knot, an open knot, um, this number is uh, much larger. Now, this is an example of a system that if it was in that context of, imagine you have a, a polymer melt of, you have, so you have many polymer chains and you are looking at what is the number of discrete, you know, that discrete information of contacts, entanglements that we were talking about from the polymer physics point of view. Um, this could be a system, this could be a chain with six contacts, six topological constraints, and this also six topological constraints. But to me, at least, it seems that these would have very different mechanical properties if you have a system full of these things or full of straight segments like that. For example, the way I think about it is that if you take this, this uh, first one and you pull it, then it seems that it would go out more easily relatively to this other one, which might actually tighten a knot and lead to maybe breaking or something like that. Okay, so, so great, we have these measures, right? And um, they existed since Gauss basically, but it took us a while to actually uh, dare to apply them to open curves, but people have been doing this for a while. So we want to apply it now. Oh, here's some more um, examples of how this number changes. But then we go on to apply it to these polymer systems, right? Because we want to measure the average absolute linking number in a system or the average absolute right in a system. And we face the following situation that uh, these are uh, these polymer melts and solutions, they are usually simulated using periodic boundary conditions. So in these cases, in those systems, we cannot Due to, in order to avoid having boundary effects with the current computer um, capacity, um, we, um, we have to use periodic boundary conditions. That means whenever a monomer exits a phase, so this is a cubic box, basically. Uh, this is a cartoon representation of that. And I've been using some uh, uh, pictures from a, a famous textbook by um, uh, Rubinstein and Corbin. So uh, when a monomer exits from one phase in that situation, it re-enters from the opposite. So you see when it exits, it re-enters from the opposite phase. And also when you apply this certain uh, forces to atoms, so then this atom here might feel the force from an atom that is from, the, from a translation of this atom from another box. Um, so in this, so what actually goes on is that um, you are simulating, in fact, a, an infinite system by doing that, because you have, uh, you do everything in the box, but by accounting all that is going on in the periodic images, it is as if your system is formed by gluing these uh, uh, 
copies of this box in all three dimensions. So you might say, what is that? Why is that a problem? Well, because this is what, again, in cartoon representation in two dimensions, um, this is what entanglement might look like in that system. And what do we see here? We see that uh, if we were to focus just on what happens inside the cell, which is what we actually simulate, right? We just simulate the cell then we would have these short segments interacting with each other. And okay, each one would have a certain contribution, but we wouldn't capture the more complex entanglement. So if we were looking just at this chain here, this portion with this red chain, we would find some linking, but we would forget about the fact that this cannot escape these other constraints from the, the other side. So that would, we would miss information if we were looking just at what is going on inside this cubic cell. Instead, if we look at the entire infinite system, which has the entire three-dimensional complexity, we have infinitely many repetitions of things. So we don't want to keep repeating the same information, which would be an infinite calculation anyway. So that's why after a lot of um, looking for the right way to define a linking number in that situation, we define the periodic linking number. So the idea there is that we have this generating chain, uh, blue and red arcs, which form these infinitely many copies of blue and red curves. And we call them free chains as in free vector. And then you have each, if you choose a specific component, you call it an image of the free chain. So I1 is an image of the free chain I. So we give those definitions to help us explain the main idea. The, the focus here is that what we are looking at is we look at the entire collection infinite of two, it is a pairwise linking number, pairwise in the sense of pairs of infinite collections of chains, pairs of the all the red and blue curves. And you want to capture an entanglement without repetition. So we say, choose an image of the blue curve, it doesn't matter which one, and look at all its linking with all the red curves in the system. So it is a sum of Gauss linking numbers. Um, so just the, it would be the linking number of, uh, let's say if we choose an image of the I curve I naught, we would add the linking numbers with all the other chains. And that, that definition is symmetric. So if we were taking linking number of J with I, so if we were instead choosing an image of J and taking its linking number with all the blue chains, that will give us the same number. It does not depend on which image we choose for the calculation. Um, and it has no repetitions because all the pairs involved in these linking numbers, they are all in different relative positions. For closed chains, like the example I was just showing, that seemed very simple, right? Because actually it was a finite sum. We would have, if I unfold this image of the blue curve and add up all the linking number with the red, I have just three components that actually link and the rest are at perfect zero. So um, they don't contribute anything to the sum. But when we have an open curves, then even things that are further apart they, and may not at this moment seem to link, or at least from this point of view, because remember the linking number is an average over all projections, maybe things here don't seem to interact, but if you look at them from another point of view, they might interact. So it is an infinite sum actually. And similarly, you can define this for infinite chains, like the, like the ones that you see here. The image then of an infinite chain is a finite arc like this, because all the rest are copies of this finite unfolding. And if you take the linking number of this segment with all the red, also it would give an infinite sum. But the good thing is that this converges. So the periodic linking number for closed, open, or infinite chains has all these nice properties as we would like something that involves a linking number to have, which means being invariant for closed curves, being a continuous function of the chain coordinates for open curves, being symmetric. 
Um, and also for the closed curves, it does coincide with an intersection number in the, the three manifold uh, formed by um, identifying the faces of the periodic box if we are interested in more connections to topology. Okay, so, so this is uh, something I wanted to mention because of many people who might be working with also periodic systems like that. Uh, but now let's go back to the motivation, right, of all that. So we did all that because we wanted to measure, as I said, linking in systems with periodic boundary conditions, this, which simulate polymers. And here we did a very toy model simulation of uh, some polymers, polymer-like systems. So we have this uh, um, uh, bead spring, uh, a bead spring model where you we place the the original chains in a, a very specific original conformations. They are not random conformations or equilibrated. They start like this, and um, but in that allows us to really control the initial topologies and in order to understand what is their effect. Also, another uh, point in those systems are that uh, they are very short. They are very short chains, very, very well below what would be what is called the entanglement length. That is below uh, the characteristic entanglement, uh, a length beyond which entanglement has a mechanical effects. But we wanted to see even in this simple situation where um, we have uh, we don't have any knots at all, right? The entanglement is very subtle if there is any. Um, we wanted to see whether our tools will capture something. So we start with these four systems and we do it in two different uh, cases. One case, we have the chains as short as you see here, very, very short chains. In the other case, we have the chains infinite they extend throughout the periodic box so as to not be able to change their original conformation really, other than the geometry can change, but not the topology. Um, and so we do a molecular dynamic simulation of uh, semi-flexible chains, uh, Lennard jones potential and just the Langevin thermostat. So uh, this is not a very accurate um, way of uh, doing a simulation for, for these systems. We could ignore the solvent if it was uh, if the system was a little bit denser, but again, um, this is a, a toy model. Okay, uh, it is more of a proof of concept, uh, I think, for for what we want to discuss here. So we do an oscillatory shear experiment for this system. That means you have this cubic box, and you imagine you move one face, the top face of the box, back and forth, according to this uh, sinusoidal. And then at specific times in that, uh, in that, as you do it for one period, you um, calculate the stress tensor. And then you do this for different, the different um, um, frequency of oscillations. And we average the result, we do it for many uh, periods. So what do you expect to see if, um, if this is the deformation that we are actually doing, um, the stress of the system, um, if it was following exactly the deformation, so there was no phase lag, that would be representative of a solid. But if, it was, if there was a pi over two phase lag, that would be representative of a liquid. So for a uh, viscoelastic material, we would expect something in between. And uh, by doing a least square fit to this function for the stress, we find uh, we can capture these two parameters, which are related to this phase lag, the loss modulus representing how liquid-like is a material versus the storage modulus, how solid-like a material is. Okay, and I will show you here just for some uh, short break, uh, how these look like. So this is the first, we start with just parallel chains, the infinite version. So I will be showing just one image of a chain, but this extends to infinity, this first case. And we are moving it around and you see, we see some bundling of, of this system, but the topology cannot change. And then 
um, we have the open curves, and they now they they want to deform and uh, they want to actually if we were able to look at it from different projections they don't really entangle with each other okay so they are able to escape their original conformation then this uh, first uh, more of a weave conformation um, again the topology cannot change but the geometry changes and now what we can see for the open case is that with the system remember this is uh, uh, in periodic boundary conditions so there's more images of all those things they now they cannot escape as much as they could before from their original conformation and similarly we can see um, the other examples sorry for the visualization there it's been there for a while so uh, again, the, the, the geometry can change, not the topology. And here, again, now we see an even more uh, that the chains are not allowed to move past from their entanglement so much. At least not in the timescales I'm showing here, right? So um, these simulations take a long time. So I'm going to show you here the how the systems look all, all together in general. So the infinite systems, they bundle together, they open chains. When they started with the a very parallel one, the very the simplest woven configuration, um, then this become almost like they occupy certain blobs. They do are, are make these blobs of really not much entangled chains. They're too short anyway. Um, and then the next one, we form uh, in the open case, now they form tubes of propagated uh, entanglement or in general, the chains cannot escape. So maybe we can call that entanglement. In, in general, there is a, a propagation in one dimension of connectivity, let's say, of the chains. Uh, for the second and third one, they, the second one is a, basically a denser version of the first one. Now in this case, uh, we have a planar, uh, like a lamella structure of um, interconnected uh, curves. And for the third one, there is a third dimension here. So we have planes that are also connected by uh, a bunch of, uh, of curves. So it is almost propagation in three dimensions of this connectivity. Okay, so this is what we see in general. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of these systems. So the, um, in, solid, in solid symbols, I show the, solid, the storage modules. And in empty symbols, the viscous loss modules, the loss modules. So this is for the infinite systems. And with the exception of the third, the last system, uh, which uh, I suspect it, it, is, uh, it is the system that is the mostly entangled. Um, we see that for all those systems, the uh, storage modulus is above the uh, loss modulus, which is in a sense uh, expected because um, that would be expected for, for a gel. And this, these chains that are infinite, it is as if they are somehow uh, cross-linked somewhere at infinity. So. Uh, maybe in that sense it is expected. I think the most interesting uh, situ uh, the most interesting case is the one of the open curves where we see a transition. So even though the chains are very short, we do see capture a transition for these uh, frequencies that we studied here of uh, at some at some characteristic frequency for different for each system we see uh, that the solid symbols of each system transition to be above the um, empty symbols, meaning that at some characteristic frequency and, uh, and after, the systems behave more like solids than liquids, that very roughly. Um, that is what it means for the storage modulus uh, to become greater than the lost modulus, if we can say that. 
Okay, so we see we do see this this transition, which could indicate a viscoelastic response. And here is what we see for the right of these systems. So this, these are the these are the right for the longer frequency um, uh, simulations that we did, um, which show that the the systems are the the results for the systems are grouped together for each system. And overall, we see a trend for these particular configurations we started with um, that the right seems to be uh, increasing the more liquid like the response of the material is. That might seem counterintuitive in general because you would imagine more complexity, um, meaning more right, meaning more. Uh, solid-like response. But I think this result here is, um, is, is because of how we started the system and because it is a solution so that when there is enough space, there is enough space here for the chains to disentangle and attain higher right just because they can um, attain conformations that are um, like those of random walks, let's say. There are no constraint conformations. So they tend to values, uh, they, they, can, they don't have to be extended by inter, uh, with entanglements with, with other chains. For the periodic linking number, we see that the more, um, uh, the less periodic linking number there is, the more liquid like the material is. And, and this is expected, right? This is expected. So more linking with other chains, more entanglement, more solid, uh, more solid, like let's say response. Okay, and recently I've been working with um, a master's student and an undergraduate student. And uh, we have been looking at polymer melts now. So polymer melts of different molecular weight. So 20, 100, 200, before the systems were at 20, the ones we were looking at, and they were not polymer melts. They were those particular woven configurations. Now here we are looking at really pre-equilibrated samples that then we equilibrated through molecular dynamics. And then we started the oscillatory series experiment. Um, the data is a bit noisy, but I think that overall we can see uh, what I'm highlighting here in yellow, a trend that indicates that the higher, the, the more liquid-like response, the complexity in these polymer melts is decreasing. More importantly, I will focus on uh, this quantity um, that we called earlier the distance between entanglements, because that is a quantity that can be actually um, inferred from experiments. And in, I, I'm sorry for the quality here of this uh, writing, but um, some time ago, we devised a, a, a method for calculating the entanglement length that combines both this algorithm that reduces the length and captures this local context and the right of the chains. And that gave us a same gave us a semi analytical formula for the entanglement length. I present it here. There's more into that, but uh, I don't want to spend um, all my time talking about this. So for the this simulation that I just showed, we calculate we use this uh, this approach to calculate the entanglement time. So the entanglement length for those systems we had already calculated, and now here we calculate the entanglement time, and um, we are in this regime uh, in, that, uh, in those simulations. So the entanglement time is this tau e number. So this is where we would expect uh, the um, storage and loss modulus to intersect. And these are the systems that are below the entanglement length. So there, there is no entanglement really. But you see for the systems of 100 and uh, greater that we, where the intersection that we is where we see the intersection happening, it is close to, if not exactly, where our um, writhe and z 
estimation of tau e falls. So this is, this is um, I think, another indication that we can capture uh, mechanically relevant um, information using topology in those systems. I don't know if it's topology, the right and the linking number, but um, topologically inspired, maybe. Um, okay. I will discuss about something, just going a step further here. But if you are tired, you can stop me to ask questions. Because... I have a question. Yes. Sorry. So, um, the ride, so in your picture, in your surprising result, where it seemed like the ride was going the wrong way. Yes. So you would also say then that individual polymers then would diffuse more slowly, right? Because if they're more writhy, then they're going to also be, they're going to be bigger. So the question is, uh, I think that all these relations that I, I'm plotting here, so I'm trying to figure out some relation, it really depends on the system because this is a solution. It's not a melt, right? Right. So, so it isn't. If if you had such big writhe in a melt, it would be the diffusion would be more difficult. I I suspect because you have an entangled self entangled chain in the presence of other chains, so it is difficult for it to move in, in general. But if it is just a, uh, if it has attained, if it doesn't have anything surrounding. And then it will attain a random conformation, which uh, we know as the length increases, uh, the, the entanglement complexity of the random conformation will also increase. But that doesn't mean, so it is more a, a matter of how big is the chain. So maybe that's what you asked from the beginning. So a larger writhe, which would the writhe in a situation where there is no entanglement with other chains would increase uh, accordingly following some power law of uh, the length, the molecular weight of the chains. Right, and the viscosity and the fluid of the yes, whole thing, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Eleni, but uh, as far as I understand, you don't have hydrodynamic interactions here in your simulation. Therefore, your friction coefficient for a polymer is just proportional to the number of monomers, and it is not affected by its conformation. Right, yes. but if you did an experiment, there would be a solution. In solution, yes, indeed. Yes, so this is not, a, it doesn't accurately depict that situation. So I couldn't infer it from these simulations. But um, yes, this is, this is right. So the, this other simulation that I was just talking about, that would be, it is still the similar, um, parameters involved, but, but because it is a polymer melt, we can argue that the solvent, um, uh, ignoring the solvent in that way, it would be okay, maybe. Yeah, for a melt, of course, yeah, but you said it's solution, right? Here, yeah, yes, this is, this is solution, yes. This other system, the preliminary results I show here, these are for polymer melts, uh, but these ones are, they, they suffer from that, um, Inaccuracy, definitely. Can I ask it? Oh, you, you continue. Go, go, go ahead, yes, you can ask it. I, I wanted to, to, to understand better about your treatment of periodic boundary conditions. I am used to seeing about periodic boundary conditions as uh, as a system which lives on the torus. Yes. So if I have a polymer ring which lives on the torus, then uh, there are obviously many different topological classes. This ring can be closed without going around the torus or going around the torus once or going around the other uh, uh, side of the torus any integer number of times. So I do not quite understand how this trivial aspect of periodic boundary condition uh, is connected to your construction of an infinite sum. So if, if we have this, uh, the case of closed curves, like the, oops, like the one that, oh, sorry. 
the, the one that we see that case A. So now if we were doing this identification of the faces to make a, a, a three torus, or let's say it's a two, two periodic boundary conditions. So we are in what we would call a thickened torus, what we form. Then looking, we would have just uh, really two components in that thickened torus because this will get glued with this one and this will get glued with that one inside that thickened torus. And then to define their linking number, it would be the linking number of these objects living in the thick and torus. So maybe we could define it as the typical linking number that we have already uh, in three space. Um, but if we have, especially in the case where we have uh, infinite chains, then these are homologically non-trivial. So meaning, I, I think this is what you were saying, uh, uh, talking about, and maybe I uh, didn't understand exactly. Then it goes through the, let's say if it was on a solid torus, it goes through the hole in the middle. So that affects how we can measure linking number. It is linking number in subject to being in that, in that space. So there is, uh, as far as I know, there, there are some very complicated defin definitions of a sort of, not, they don't call it linking number, but intersection number of, uh, of, um, two chains in, uh, in, um, in a manifold other than not in R3, but um, so I'm not sure if this is what you asked. Uh, maybe I go in another direction or more the connections to topology. I think you were talking about polymers. Uh, no, I was asking about topology. So your oh. answer actually was quite, quite insightful. Thank you. So yes, you have to define the linking number then it's not, it's not defined. Um, there, are, there is something called intersection number and that is very complicated to define based on the, on the um, where we are, thick and torus, solid torus or are, um, three torus. But what I find more difficult going in that direction to, uh, to, dis to discuss entanglement is what about the open curves? Because when we have open curves now, really we have gone, we, we go away from the notion of topology to the notion of geometry, which is important because how are we going to deform it? What is an acceptable way of deforming this to form a solid torus so that it has a, that it captures what is going on in three space, which the three space is what we want to simulate periodic boundary conditions. So, so that's where I, I think that it doesn't, it, it is better to work with the three periodic boundary condition infinite space, the infinite periodic cover, uh, cover space, let's say, of the um, solid torus or whatever, how many periodic boundary conditions we have. Okay. So um, eventually we do use the cutoff though, because as I said, this is an infinite sum. So we do use a nice cutoff that still remains being symmetric and uh, captures uh, whatever would be the most uh, important contributions as obstacles at the very end. I understand. Okay, so maybe in the last minutes, I will talk about something, uh, taking things a little bit further. So all this so far has been linking number, right? So many people might, uh, special topologists wouldn't be interested in that. But uh, in polymers, let's say again, a big question that um, I've seen uh, being addressed is whether entanglement is pairwise or multi-chain. And I think that I had heard also um, Shura talking about that and it's inspiring uh, question. So um, here you have simple knots and there is links, many chain links. And maybe another question is looking at this Borromean ring here. And if we were looking at all the pairwise linking number of this, all these pairs that we have here, they all are zero, but we cannot take one away from the other. So what, what should we do there? Um, one would say, let's compute the Jones polynomial. And I have compute in italics because yes, maybe you can define the Jones polynomial, but it's another thing to compute it, let alone compute it in periodic boundary conditions. And, um, and also what about if it has, if it is open, 
then what can we do? For the linking number, we said there is a rigorous way to define pairwise linking, but how about the uh, Jones polynomial? Is there a Jones polynomial for open curves? And, and this is what I will talk about uh, in just a few slides. Um, I will switch into, oh, I'm sorry. Just use this, it's perfect. Okay. All right, so um, I will talk about some recent work which allows not only the Jones polynomial, but I think that it will allow other invariants, even more sophisticated, to be applied to um, open, open curves and eventually to all those physical systems that are motivation. And just to dramatize here a little bit, uh, to see how many closed curve measures of entanglement there are in node theory and what we have so far, the Gauss linking integral, all right? So um, what appeared about 10 years maybe ago uh, was this approach of uh, maybe even more than 10 years of, okay, we have an open curve. So to study its entanglement with better tools than the linking number, uh, let's close it. Right, that's something that people have been doing. And initially they, th they said, let's do an end-to-end -end closure. But then um, I think it was Millet and uh, others that said, let's do it in a more rigorous way. Okay, still we will do an approximation, right, of an open curve by a closed curve. So already we, have, we, ha we are settling for an approximation, but let's say, let's do the best possible approximation. And that was achieved by taking the open curve and doing um, many, many different closures. Instead of doing the end-to-end, -end, make different choices of closures in a nice way using a sphere, et cetera, and that makes it a more rigorous definition of closure. And then that will give us, we, will we might get different knot types according to how we close the curve. But then most of them might give a specific knot type. And if that happens, then we can approximate the open curve by the closed knot that we came up with the most times. And uh, so that has been applied a lot, especially in proteins. And then um, there has been an extension of that using a notion of notoids. So notoids were uh, discovered by Turai or introduced by Turai. Um, they are really two-dimensional objects. Remember how we use the uh, diagrams to look at knots and uh, um, one can use the open knot diagrams. And these are really, this is a theory on diagrams. Um, and one can look at the open curve, take projections of the open curve, look at the knotoid type, the, the diagram. As I said, knotoids are classifications of diagrams. And again, this method settles for an approximation of the open curve by a diagram. So you approximate the three-dimensional object by the best projection, best, let's say, in the sense of, um, uh, well, in some sense, best approximation by two-dimensional diagram. But these ideas are all very helpful for what I will talk about defining the Jones polynomial and the Gaffman bracket polynomial for open curves. They are a combination of, of all these ideas because uh, especially notoids. Notoids, these are notoids. The first one here is the trivial notoid. This one now is a non-trivial notoid. And how can we tell a trivial notoid from a non-trivial? You can do all these, these moves on these diagrams are allowed but you are not allowed to do any moves that involve the endpoints. So you keep something about, about notedness of these diagrams fixed by allowing only this type of moves, but not these moves uh, that interfere with the endpoints. But all this is on diagrams, okay? Um, and then on these diagrams, again, I think Turai was the one who introduced um, the bracket polynomial, uh, or maybe it was, uh, I, I don't remember who came first to introduce that, but the famous Kaufman bracket polynomial was 
computed for notoids with a small change that instead of having uh, here the standard way of defining the bracket polynomial involves a num not. Now you have here an empty notoid. Okay, and then you define the Kaufman bracket polynomial for those who are familiar, and that allows an easy definition of the Jones polynomial, uh, easier than uh, more combinatorial than the original definition of the Jones polynomial. Okay, so we can do that for these diagrams. And then we said, well, why don't we do it for all possible diagrams that you can get from an open curve in three space? An open curve in three space can give different projections, right? And each projection is a notoid for which we can calculate the Jones polynomial. And then what we can do, instead of taking the best projection, we take all the projections and we define an average polynomial. So this average polynomial now, it can be defined an average Jones polynomial. It has many nice properties. If the curve is closed in three space, it gives us, first of all, the classical Jones polynomial. If it is an open curve in, sp in three space, now you get a polynomial that has real coefficients instead of um, integer coefficients, if you remember the Jones polynomial. And those coefficients are continuous functions of the chain coordinates. coordinates. And moreover, now this is polynomial is just the polynomial of the open curve. It is not the polynomial of any associated knot or any associated notoid. It is just associated with the open curve in three space. So this is an example of what this polynomial looks like. So these are some snapshots of a polygonal curve in three space where just one edge is moving. And you see if we were allowed to have one more edge, this could maybe break there and come and thread inside a trefoil maybe. And you see the polynomial, how it is changing, the coefficients of the polynomial are changing. And if we were doing some more drastic deformations, not only the coefficients, but new powers of A would appear. This is the bracket polynomial uh, that we see here. And for comparison, I have the polynomial of the trefoil and of a notoid there. And we can see it. This is for the Jones polynomial. This is the plotting here, the Jones polynomial of the curve in time. Time is shown by these different curves. T here is the Jones variable of the polynomial. So I'm plotting the polynomial itself for comparison. This would be the Jones polynomial of a trefoil knot. And you see how you could be able to visualize nothing happening in this way. It is an abstract way still, we are working with a polynomial, but that's, that's how it is with, um, with uh, nodes. We can look at the roots of the polynomial to, in a way to visualize information. Moreover, last thing I want to point out is that, as I said before, one thing is to define, first of all, these things. Another thing is to compute. And the linking number, the good thing about the linking number is that when we compute it, we don't do any integration. Remember that integral? We don't do any integration and we don't do any approximation. The reason for that is that Banjov introduced maybe in the 60s, I think, or 70s, I don't remember the date exactly, but a long time ago, he introduced a way to calculate the linking number for polygonal curves that only depends on the geometry using some very nice geometrical ideas, an exact result that doesn't need any integration. Um, Randy, uh, I'm not sure, Randy mentioned, uh, I don't know, sorry, that chat is for me. No, no, okay. well, yeah, I don't understand what Ian wrote. Okay, so, um, so let's, let me go on and, and mention that the reason why I showed this simple example with four edges is because actually we obtain a, a, we obtained a closed form for that integral, which doesn't require any integration and all those things um, for three and four edges, which, okay, it's, it is, I know it is, um, it seems like 
um, if we have to move so slowly, we will never arrive at anything. But, but actually, some of these curves that we have been talking about, even if they are polygonal of 1,000 polygonal edges, let's say edges, um, they might be represented by those primitive paths, those backbones of the uh, polymer tubes um, by less than that, maybe 10 edges. So it's not totally impossible maybe to get to close formulas like this one, which the polynomial, so the polynomial for a polygonal curve with four edges, we can show that it is actually obtained by, uh, ha would have this, this form as a polynomial, where here's the bracket polynomial of a specific notoid that can occur. And the only variable really that is important is this probability here, a geometric probability for which we need to obtain a closed formula. And this is that closed formula, which it only relies on checking some things which are nothing but dot products and cross products, and then taking the spherical area of a, 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 a spherical rectangle, a, a triangle or a spherical um, uh, rectangle that is formed by great circles with these normal vectors. All of these vectors are just in the geometry of the polygonal curve. Okay, so um, this is uh, this is more about that formula, and I would like to uh, acknowledge our funding and thank you very much for for the time. I I thought of talking a little bit longer because I thought the, um, that we are assigned for an hour and a half and hope I didn't tire you too much. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. So, so um, I'm going to start with a question before asking if there are other questions. So these, these notoid polynomials that you have, they don't have integer coefficients, right? The notoid would have so, so um, you showed some with non-integer coefficients. Yes. So the open curve polynomial right. don't have because notoids are these projections, right? So sure. uh, there are so many different definitions. I I call open chains these things that live in three space, and these have real coefficients. The nodes and notoids have integer coefficients. This is a polynomial traditional right. equation nine. So mm -hmm. the fact that the fact that the that the sum of 0.71 and 0.29 is an integer, and 0.06 and 0.94 that's that, that makes sense. There's some reason for that. Yes, because these are really coming out of geometric probabilities. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. And so good. So if they're probabilities, is the can you interpret them? Um, can you interpret them that way? Yes. Instead of projections, can you interpret them? Uh, um, as you grab the two ends and you pull them off in some ran in a random direction and you ask, does it actually uh, not or not? Well, it, it is related, right? Because uh, it depends in which directions, the opposite directions you're going to pull them, right? There are many, infinitely many opposite. Directions. Right. So is this, the, is this, is this saying that 6% of them will, will, will catch a knot and, and 94% won't? So in, in, this, in this particular example, this is a very simple, right, with four edges. It, it might mean what you just said. But in some cases where it is more complex, it might be that the, it's not so clear how, how you can split the 6% and the 94%. You know, the, they might have mixed all together different possible states of uh, right. different- I see. So in this case, yes, you can break it down to what what this is all formed by. Are you saying that in more complex cases, uh, you may uh, end up having knots of different types if you pull it in different directions? Mm -hmm. Yes, you might have all that and all that information. Well, of course, you can always keep that information as a knot spectrum, which is what people were doing before, but they were choosing the most probable knot to associate to an open curve. But this object, uh, this polynomial, as an altogether as an entity, it will be something that it, it might um, it might have all that information altogether in a polynomial of all the constituents of of this 
chain in three space. And if you want, you might be able to pull it up, break it down into what it is made out of. Um, so in practice, that, that is still very useful. But I think that, um, I, I don't know, this is a new object we defined. Who, who knows what else we might be able to extract from this polynomial altogether now? Um, yeah, so I'm talking to myself about that. It's, uh, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to look into for that. Please, other, other questions? Uh, of course, we want to apply this to polymers eventually, right? We want to say, if you get a collection of chains, the Jones polynomial for many curves, right? right. I, I haven't tried it yet, but I have a student who is creating actually a LAMPS package for uh, topological LAMPS package or standalone package to compute these things for polymers. Um, so it will be interesting to, to see what we get definitely in that case. All right, well, um, there don't seem to be further questions now, but you know how to get in touch with Eleni. Also, um, we have our final seminar for the semester in two weeks. It'll be Henry Siegerman.